Hi, I'm Wells Thompson, writer of The Catskin and the Rose, Mechaton, and Frankenstein the Unconquered. You can find me on Twitter at Wells Thomp and Blue Sky under the same name. And you're watching and listening to Two Geeks Talking. Hi, I'm Rachel Disler. I'm the artist on The Catskin and the Rose, The Nightcrawlers, and The Color of Always. Uh, you can find me at Red Tie Bear on Twitter, Instagram, Tumblr, and Blue Sky. And you're watching and listening to Two Geeks Talking. Good morning, afternoon, evening, everyone. Two Geeks Talking is an entertainment industry interview show where we interview the creative people from the comic, film, TV, movie, and video gaming industries. And of course, I'm your host, Kurt Sasso. We're joined today by two returning guests. This time, they are on a co-collaborative project which is an amazing new comic series. We're joined by the ever-talented Wells Thompson and Rachel Distler, of course, from The Catskin and the Rose. How are you both doing today? I'm doing pretty good. Just came back from like a trip out, so I'm feeling a little stretched, a little relaxed. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm doing fantastic. Thank you for asking. For those that don't know anything about yourselves as creative people and what you're bringing to Two Geeks Talking. My name is Wells Thompson. I'm a comic writer, uh, all around mistake. Uh, no, I, I uh, write the it, uh, series uh, Mechaton, Frankenstein, The Unconquered, uh, and now this uh, graphic novella, The Cat's in the Rose, as well as a bunch of uh, anthology stories for uh, Band of Bards and, and a whole bunch of other people. I do horror and other things as well. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I don't want to cut walls off or anything. That's oh no, uh, please cut though. me off because I'll just continue to. to <laughs> but, but but that 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 smile that filled the air there is just like no, I can't, I can't take it. <laughs> I can't. I'm Rachel Disler. I, uh, you know, I'm the artist on the project, and I have a few projects under my belt at this point. Um, I have like the Nightcrawlers coming out from a blaze uh, this September. Should be, it's like finally at the printer. Uh, I just did some work on Swat Cow. I previously did work on The Color of Always. Um, so yeah, just a lot of different kinds of stories in the background right now. And so I'm really excited to be doing a like action adventure romance. You know, I've done kind of a, surprisingly to me a lot of horror at this point. So it's nice uh, to do something a little softer, a little funnier. Uh, so I hope I bring, you know, some energy and some liveliness to the artwork. And yeah, that's, uh, that's why I hope to bring it to the table in the project. Well, I have to ask, of course, uh, the casket and the rose. What if, what is the elevator pitch for this new comic series? Sorry, graphic novella, right? Yeah, it's a, uh, graphic novella. Uh, we are not promising we're going to make it into a series. Uh, we, we've talked about maybe doing stuff in the future, but no promises right now. Uh, for our own mental health. Uh, <laughs> no, uh, uh, but the Cat's Game of the Rose is a uh, adventure romance uh, centered around two women who enter into a sword fighting competition to marry into the royal family of this fictional kingdom. Uh, and as they're uh, dueling each other, they discover they might have some latent feelings there. They start to gain a respect. They start to maybe... Uh, fall in love. The problem being that the winner of this competition will again marry its Thora family, and the winner will, or the loser, will be dead. So, problems abound. Well, that makes dating difficult. Yeah. <laughs> I was going to oh. say, indeed. I I also uh, found myself in a position where I either had to uh, uh, run away with my wife or kill her. So, yeah, no, it comes from experience, is what I'm saying. This is a real life story. All great stories come from experience. <laughs> I mean, a battle to the death, you know, a love of, you know, a, a budding romance that ends in death. It almost sounds like a reverse Romeo and Juliet without Romeo muck mucking things up. I would have to say that that probably makes things a little better. Uh, <laughs> having, having to have read that play and watched the play and it's just like, you know, I feel like things could be a little bit less complicated. I know that's sort of the driving force, but eh, come on. Come on, you know? Let's talk about the, the main characters that we happen upon in this particular amazing series so far. Our protagonists are uh, Iselda and Camille. Iselda is uh, the cat, the titular cat skin. She is a member of kind of the poorest cast of this kingdom in a very, and in a very stratified sense, like has no chance at upward mobility. So her skill in fighting is the only thing that she really has going for her. It's the only way she's been able to survive. 
uh, she enters this competition as uh, kind of a long shot, like the only way that she can get out of uh, a life of poverty. She is feisty and arrogant and very fun and quick-witted. And then on the other hand, you have Camille, who, is, who similarly grew up in poverty, but grew up uh, in a faraway kind of foreign land and has traveled to uh, participate in this tournament for similar reasons to Isolde, but is much more disciplined, martial, uh, and a bit of an eternal disaster, which I love about her. They have a lot in common, but sometimes uh, with a lot of their personality, it's, it is sort of an opposite attract scenario. The more I talk about them and the more I see them, like the more that comes out in the art, uh, the more I just love these characters and, and getting to explore them. And the more goblin energy that Iselda presents <laughs> in general. Like <laughs> I saw that uh, panel from the sort of self-interview you're doing uh, with, with them, uh, Rachel, and I was just like, yes. I love this. This is exactly what I envisioned. <laughs> That's what I loved about the art that I got to see there as well, too. And, and looking on the Kickstarter campaign as well. Ray, Rachel, you're obviously you're a very talented artist. We've had you on the show talking about your past works as well, too. Talk about when you first worked with Wells on creating these characters. What was the initial images that came to your mind that set these characters apart from each other, but also drew them together? I would have to say that, of course, the thing that pops out the most reading the script is uh, how different Isolde and Camille are from each other. So you automatically have that really, you know, fun, you know, tropey and yet like very charismatic interplay of like two opposites, you know, falling in love with each other. Um, just like kind of immediately gaining the respect of each other's like different um attitudes and the respect of just how talented they are as fighters and just uh having a lot of fun with them both colliding in terms of like their personalities and the complementary like uh, relationship that you get between you know just like you know one's the messy one one's the clean <laughs> one. you know, it's just <laughs> it's it's a tale as old as time you know uh so you have you have goblin energy as Zelda, and you have like the much cooler uh camille and it, like it's it's always going to be a field rife with just like material to work with so you know when i have the script with me and i'm just like interpreting the characters like i want to keep it more lively more expressive like I, I usually would work uh, traditionally, so this year is a little different in in terms of the way I work. Like I, you know, I finally have this iPad and stuff, so uh, I find that with uh, digital, that's kind of nice. Is it lets you fail repeatedly, very quickly, and the faster you get through those fail stages, the more you can start pushing it towards like the refined state. Like, I don't have to keep erasing, you just toss the layer and toss the layer. So that allows me to just kind of keep pushing it, pushing it uh, until like I'm somewhere that I want to be. And that's, I think, is really paying off with um, being able to play with their body language and play with like the setting and the way that they interact with those things. Yeah, like I'm just having a lot of fun, uh, <laughs> you know, like Wells was mentioning, yeah, I have like this little kind of side comic that I think I would like to release to help push uh, towards one of our next um, stretch goals because I am just ecstatic seeing more work from Tango who, uh, you know, if we can make it to 20K, we'll get like another mini comic featuring the queen who's um, a very standout uh, background character in the story. You know, thinking about it logically, if there is a tournament you know, where you marry into the royal family, she would have been the previous winner. So like, what is that about? What, where is she coming from? What are her thoughts? And combining both that concept and Tango's art is making me uh, scream and cry. And <laughs> so I would like to sort of have a little comic about like, hey, this is our story. These are the stretch goals. I don't know, I guess you can't see it. It would be weirder if you could. Uh, this chair I'm sitting on, I broke literally the last day I was doing the art on the night crawlers. Uh, I just leaned too far and the side snapped and now the back is just, it's taped on, it's sliding off right now. 
And so it's like, look, if we hit 20K, we get a mini comic from Tango. I can get a new art chair. It's going to be fabulous. So why not play up uh, what I think the best part of the comic is? And that is like their interactions and, and their personalities. Yeah, I, I was going to go with what was your color palette for the characters, but the sandwich question was kind of interesting <laughs> too. But um, <laughs> because we we briefly touched on your your color theory, and we touched on that aspect with your other past characters here, what colors were you envisioning with these characters when you started to put their their dress and their uh, outfits together for this particular comic? Well, in this case, um, I obviously wanted two contrasting color palettes, and they both sort of reflect their personalities. You know, one is, uses a cooler palette and one uses a warmer palette. The first palette that I had thought of was actually a Zelda's palette because I was thinking, you know, if we're thinking about like desert kingdoms, I didn't pick any particular direct point like on Earth, just sort of like a melding of different Oh, where would I, where would I place it? Somewhere like anywhere between the Middle East all the way to India, like that whole stretch, little bits and bobs out of my brain. Hopefully as I do the pages, I can, I can get some more direct reference, but just kind of thinking about, you know, the fantasy settings I, I imagine pulling from that like mental library. Um, I knew I wanted to focus on warm colors as well throughout the like a uh, background, excuse me, deserts, you know, warm palettes, and then use like the contrasting blues and purples and greens, like as kind of spot color. Mm. Uh, so with her, you know, uh, something very complimentary, you know, she has sort of like kind of a salmon. I can't even think Gosh. of the word for it right now. Yeah. Um, with like some of the like light kind of green patterning on there just like for a little bit of pop because she is very like red toned mm -hmm. um and then obviously Camille for her cooler personality I kind of wanted to pull a little bit more from like that more traditional western European dualist uh imagery and pick maybe sort of like th that more royal blue hers being a little bit tighter around the body, a little bit more masculine versus something more flowing. You know, just keep it, keep the interplay yeah. uh, happening, um, both like in terms of color and in terms of like silhouette, that kind of thing. So then Wells, why was this an important story for you to write? Ooh, for a number of reasons. Uh, I had never written a romance before and it was kind of, it, I, I have what I lovingly call creatively uh, ADHD. Uh, so I have a, like, all ages uh, science fiction action comedy, I have horror action, I've done a lot of straight horror, I've done a lot of literary fiction. Romance is always something that I've, especially earlier in life, like, never cared for and never really wanted to explore. So as I was prompted more and more and, and have kind of pushed myself creatively more and more, I thought, you know, what would I do with a romance? And it was specifically uh, one of the project that uh, Rachel work, has worked on at uh, Swag House, uh, Shark Wit and the Company of Women put out, when they put out their uh, prompt to say, hey, we want people to, to write these stories and, and pitch them to us. It was sort of the inception of this idea of just like, can I convincingly have two people fall in love during a sword fight? Uh, and it was supposed to be a four page short story just to fit into an anthology and very quickly ballooned into I realized it was going to be way more than that it just the more I did it the more I was like oh this could fit in there that would be a cool moment this is a lot of tension that I would love to to really chew on and so when I reached out to Rachel uh before I had actually written it I said hey I think this is going to be like 32 maybe 48 pages at most extremely quickly like within a couple of days I was like it's going to be more than that <laughs> it's definitely going to be more than that <laughs> Uh, and I, I capped myself at, at, uh, at 72 pages. I said, I won't go any higher than that. We managed to stop at 68. <laughs> so, so we, we reined it in at the end a little bit. The romance aspect of it, the, the sort of high adventure and very low fantasy setting was something I was really interested in. I like, it started with the kind of base layer, but the more I went into it, the more it just became about expressing the characters and really loving the direction that it was going and the setting that we were in and, and sort of uh, exploring more and more of what I could do with the story. So it became kind of the reasoning unto itself. It was like, this is really interesting and I think really beautiful story to tell. 
and uh, I want to get it out there. So this is this has been my fastest turnaround, I think, of any story that I've gotten from like inception to putting it on Kickstarter. Um, <laughs> and I think that energy translates. I think a lot of people have been really jazzed about it as a result. Because like you said, you've done a lot of different genres in your writing repertoire, but how did this really push you out of your, maybe your comfort zone for as a writer? Surprisingly, not in the ways you might think. Uh, <laughs> I like I've done sapphic relationships before all, almost all of my friends for whatever reason are are queer women and i grew up around uh gay people and gay relationships so like the subject matter itself is not super foreign to me and in fact my first novel was about two women falling in love that was a while ago and that may never see the light of day but uh <laughs> But no, the, the ways it would really push me creatively was like, okay, how do I put in these like, you know, story tropes that I typically either don't like incorporate into story or like have historically not really enjoyed and sort of make them, you know, make do my own version of that in a way that I, I really like and find compelling. And also, how do I, you know, research the, or try and, and research some, a unique setting, create a new fantasy setting? Names, I, I am awful at names. So trying to not only name characters, but also like a new location and everything, you know, in it and, and create an entire cast system of, <laughs> with, with, you know, different kind of weird foreign sound, or foreign in the sense that like they don't, have a direct corollary in our world but like we can kind of understand them at first blush that was all very strange and weird and trying to to work that out but turned out to be a really fun exercise yeah hopefully <laughs> hopefully it translates pretty well in the final product obviously you have about seven days as of this recording left in the kickstarter campaign itself how has that been going for both of you from a promotion standpoint from a nerve standpoint from a product standpoint what do you have that that we're looking forward to seeing or that you're looking forward to seeing uh, those that have supported the campaign. I am so happy with the progress that we've made and I am so ready for this to be over <laughs> at the same time. Yeah, it's a very stressful process. But at, at the same time, it's been really heartwarming to see uh, everyone come out in support of it, uh, both for me and for Rachel. And people have been super excited that the more art that we put out, the more details that we put out about, about the story that we more excited people get and it's it's contagious we have a lot uh planned and a lot uh, uh to showcase uh we've already unlocked a couple of stretch goals including we're putting out fell hounds uh do you believe in an afterlife so every backer gets that for free as well uh we've got uh coming up in less than a hundred dollars <laughs> we've got our 15k st uh, stretch goal in which we will put out a fan comic that rachel and i worked on uh, a little while ago from arcane the uh, league of legends uh, tv show and uh in future stretch goals if we're lucky enough to meet them we will be able to uh put out a uh a couple of mini comics uh by first tango and then uh, rio burton as well as a uh, poster from angela Wu, all of whom are artists that are just phenomenally talented and that I have been uh, hunting for a reasons to work with for the longest time. I'm really happy to be able to incorporate them into this project. I'm going to go into the, the fan questions uh, here from the social media verse. Obviously both of you, you have seen some of them here, but there's some very valid questions. <laughs> Keeping on the train. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone that's watching this will understand what I mean once I ask the questions. <laughs> Keeping in the train of the thought of the crowdfunding campaign, Brent Fisher, they asked this following questions. Where do you think crowdfunding for independent ideas like this one currently sits compared to, say, two years ago? I'm going to leave, I think, that one a little bit to Wells only because this is sort of the first crowdfund I've been in, at least on Kickstarter where like I centrally had to be like the sole interiors and then for Zoop when we did the night crawlers, they usually handle actually most of the campaign. I guess at least if I had to chime in about um, where crowdfunding is between Kickstarter 
and Zoop. That changes the landscape, I think, just a little bit. While, while Zoop is still a drop in the bucket compared to Kickstarter, um, you know, I have noticed that there are a lot more projects um, being featured on there, which is really great. I think having like all these different options are really great. And uh, one of the nice things, again, about Zoop is that they do like build your campaign for you and they do help with like the shipping, the packaging. So if you are completely lost about having to handle all that yourself, it's like a major stress reliever because I didn't have to do any of that uh, at all by myself. You know, that is like another valid option to go. Um, while it is harder to get the eyes on Zoop simply because more people are going to be going to Kickstarter because they feature um, just a whole variety of projects um, and Zoop only focuses on, on comics as well as the ubiquity of like the Kickstarter name. Seeing how many, like just like the, a, a large swath of uh, projects on there are, are hitting their campaign goals. Yeah, it's, it's a very valid, very good way to go if, you know, you want to be a little, little bit more hands-off. Um, but yeah, then uh, I, I, I'll give the floor to Wells since he has a lot more experience running campaigns than I do. I, yeah, the, the the question I think is is if I'm remembering correctly, it's like the specifically with these kinds of sort of one-off ideas and independent projects on Kickstarter. I think the landscape is two years ago. So like during the pandemic, it sort of really popped off in a massive way. A lot of people were coming out with a lot of brand new ideas, and there was a lot of hunger for that. Um, if for no other reason than because we were all cooped up and we didn't have anywhere else to go. You know, with last year, inflation hit everyone hard. Everyone had to pull back on their wallets a little bit and, and uh, not support as widely as they were. I think we saw a little bit of a dip. And I think now that the economy is getting better, we're seeing a bit of a return. I don't know if it'll get to as like exciting and dynamic as it was uh, over the pan over the beginning of the pandemic, especially. But I do still think there's uh, a lot of good ground to cover with niche independent stuff. Uh, having having just uh, failed to fund actually a project uh, that sort of fell into that of that like really niche like wasn't genre wasn't really genre fiction. It was so, sort of literary and and aloof in that way. Got a large amount, like, you know, it got about 300 backers. It got uh, about 15 grand in funding, but didn't quite hit its goal. I do think that there is still somehow, you just have to be a little bit more careful about genre. I think certain things are, are always going to be better on Kickstarter, like horror, like erotica, like uh, certain anthologies uh, are, are able to sort of flex into uh, different genres that are uh, going to hit wider appeal. But there's definitely still room for, for smaller genre stories that aren't Cthulhu or, or Smut to, uh, to thrive. Yeah, it's just that there's a little bit more of an uphill battle for those. Like, I definitely see the difference between Mechaton and Frankenstein the Unconquered, for example. But Mechaton still funds, so there's definitely uh, a, still a voice out there for for those kind of stories, which is exciting. I'm, I'm glad of it. I hope it gets better. Do you think that it's a more crowded field in terms of independent comics and crowdfunding campaigns? Yes. <laughs> let's, let's start. Let's start with the obvious. Yes, it is. <laughs> That's not a bad thing necessarily, but it is absolutely more crowded. At, well, with, with comics, uh, the, the latest numbers on the funding rates for comics is close to 80%, I think. Wow. Or, or even more, it might be like around 83. It was somewhere between that, somewhere between 77 and 83%. So yeah, Kickstarter has an, an immaculate track record with uh, with funding comic books. I don't think that, that there being more people here is necessarily a problem or anything. And the fact that there's more people here kind of pushes up the quality and makes everyone sort of work harder to, to make, to put out a better product. So I think it's, it's ultimately a good thing and ultimately a, a better thing. Uh, for both the industry and for like each individual comic book creator, as much as sometimes it feels like maybe that uh, there's a little bit too too much competition out there or anything, ultimately it's we're not in a competition. If people are buying comics, people are buying comics. We generally aren't com we generally aren't competing with each other's dollars or for dollars as much as 
it can seem or we can sometimes feel. I just want to say, I, yeah, I think that's that's a good point because um, the more indie comics that like go up on Kickstarter and the more that people talk about their project being up on Kickstarter, um, that's just going to keep reinforcing uh, that if you are interested in indie comics and supporting indie comics and getting your hands on them to read them, that that is like a place to go. And when that you know group of people and the, like that large swath of people comes over, they're gonna discover your comic, they're gonna discover your friend's comic, they're gonna discover all kinds of um, different stories that are there. And I think having that wide array is very good just because like, say like, <laughs> If there were only five comics on there and like, you know, two of them are horror and two of them are like a superhero comic, it doesn't really detract from somebody else's project. It's not like saying like, uh, I'm going to come here specifically to buy this one mm -hmm. type of story. You're probably going to get somebody else interested in, you know, what the other person's got going on. Um, I think you know, that, that large diversity of stories is, is really ultimately um, more beneficial for everybody getting their, their project funded. You know, like we are not made out of unlimited money, but yeah. <laughs> generally I, yeah. I'd say, there's, I'd say that there is like a limit if, if everyone is putting out projects, then you can't expect the same person to go around spending, you know, $20, $30, $50 on, on all of these things. But there are going to at least branch out, get a couple of things that they might not have otherwise, see more stuff than that uh, might have otherwise, and it'll be more normalized overall. I think, and I yeah. think the trends are ultimately really, really good. Yeah, I mean, in the last probably three or four weeks, I've seen more campaigns from people I know even like blow up to really massive uh, numbers in, in a very impressive way. Cat Calamia just released one that I I haven't checked the numbers lately, but last time I saw it, it was well over 20,000. Natasha and, and uh, Michelle Abounder have Sapphic Pulp that is rapidly approaching 30K. Uh, of course, you have like Charles Stickney uh, with, uh, what is it, How I Slept My Way Through College that is absolutely blowing up as well. We have a lot of simultaneous projects put bringing in a lot of money, and I, I don't think that they are like i think people are excited about all of them i don't think they're competing with each other in any way it's totally bananagrams uh seeing uh, <laughs> absolutely just like the numbers on uh, a lot of people's comments which is just like fantastic just seeing so many big big numbers from incredibly talented writers and artists um it's definitely makes me feel like the um market for indie comics is actually improving uh, at least as, yeah, we're like we're sort of rebounding economically. People are starting a little, little more spending money back. Like I know I'm spending a little bit more on Kickstarter now too. So it was just like things are sort of petering out. Yeah, I think just even having that ecosystem of like like-minded comics, I feel like every time, you know, like we'll tweet about somebody else's project, you know, you see like some of those numbers go up. I know whenever they tweet about our uh, comic, like our numbers go up. I, it's like, you know, we're not all trying to target the same yeah. person, but we're all trying to bring in an audience. And then like from there on that, like one audience will then like kind of sort themselves yeah. out. Into their There's lines overlap. And, yeah, There's yeah sure overlap. exactly. Yeah. The comic community is a small circle of friends. That's, That's certainly true on the on the creator side. That's absolutely one question. I, I won't do all of Brent's. One question is actually from uh, at kg underscore ming. Thank you for the question. I appreciate it. Which character are each of you most like, and why? <laughs> it's hard to say because they're like I put myself into every character, whether I want to or not. Iselda, I think, is like how. I feel about myself as a creator in that like I feel very scrappy and, and like I have to fight for every bit of ground that I get and and I'm sometimes very quick to you know snap to judgment or or cross a line without without uh, meaning to and then Camille is is me talking to her when I was when I first met my wife which is to say 
absolutely a disaster. <laughs> Un, unable, unable to have a normal conversation. Um. For me, well, first of all, I want to say thanks, KG. They're uh, a baller. We all know that Brent is a great friend of mine, but uh, KG is also a very good friend. So thanks, KG. I mean, maybe it's a, another one of those, like, there are two wolves inside me situation. <laughs> One like, is well, Camille, one is Iselda. <laughs> just like, oh, they God. are both gay. <laughs> <laughs> like those wolves are both very gay. <laughs> you know, I, you know, there's there's a questionable legitimacy about the Myers Briggs test. Let's just say, <laughs> but uh, in high school we actually like filled those out. So we did a very formal one. For like, you know, there's, I'm an, like, I'm, I'm technically an INFP. When I got my numbers back, eh, hey. <laughs> when I got my numbers back, um, there was an asterisk next to the I and I'm like, hello, please excuse me, person administering these results. What, what does that mean? So the lady tells me that that asterisk next to the I means that I am point zero zero one percent closer to being introverted than extroverted which suddenly is the, the dubious nature of the myers Wix. but at least for that moment in time it shone a very strong spotlight on how i i could perceive my brain chemistry because it's, it's very true that like i i have you know sort of a, a goblin energy and then i also have like a very um, pulled back low energy. And, um, when she said that, like, I'm 0.001% closer to being introverted, I'm like, so what does that mean socially? She's like, you, like people come up to you and they just don't know which one they're going to get. And I'm like, that's true. <laughs> um, I remember I, I was helping actually a friend, um, and she was taking a psychology course and she's trying to get like, you know, just like take some notes. It was like on me and she's like, oh yeah, I have to interview some friends. And so she's like, oh, is your friend introvert or extrovert? She, she already is going, she's like, oh, you're extrovert. I'm like, I, 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 no, <laughs> like terrifically not. I, I definitely am that person that needs to peace out from the party for like 20 minutes and then like come back and I'm like rejuvenated. And like, which is definitely the Camille vibe. I'm both the person who's going to run around with a lampshade on my head a la Zelda and then you know after I'm done I'm like I need a nap I need to just like have a little night air uh and that's the Camille energy <laughs> so um I'm at once like a very dreadful mess but I'm also usually very calmly sipping a coffee while everything's on fire that so like really <laughs> when I'm doing art for the characters I'm using both of those energies to uh get them to do their funny wacky hijinks uh so the the real answer is I am both of those wolves and you just don't know which one you're gonna get that day how did I usually phrase myself I said I was an uh, introvert playing an extrovert who's really an introvert something like that <laughs> That's also very relatable. <laughs> uh, another question from Brent is, where did the inspiration for the characters' concepts come from? I, I remember when we first were talking about who the characters were and, and sort of the designs. Uh, one of the first things I said was like, I really love the design from the Gerudo in, in The Legend of Zelda. And that was sort of where we started on with Camille. Which is interesting that, that like you... <laughs> I always saw like Baidun and the, the, the fictional kingdom and the the aesthetic there as being like kind of Moroccan inspired, like South Spanish, mm -hmm. uh, Moroccan, North African. So yeah, we kind of have a whole stretch from like Ottoman Empire to India. Influences. Yeah, yeah, for sure. But uh, but yeah, no, that yeah, the the Gerudo design, uh, the design of like Dorn from uh, from a song of ice and fire that played into it quite a bit, at least on the Aselda side. And then uh, for Camille, my foundational image was a video game was also a video game character um, that was uh, this uh, duelist character that has this thick French accent and and like long long dueling sword. Um, and I just sort of <laughs> I sort of was like that but make it your own thing 
Are we both thinking about the same video game character? Because I think yours is uh, yours is from Soul Calibur, right? Because I remember you sent that oh, to yeah, me. It was absolutely. like, is this what you wanted? And I was like, yeah, basically. <laughs> <laughs> I was just like, what can I do with Raphael from Soul Calibur? <laughs> I'm always just thinking about what can I do with Soul Calibur characters secretly in my mind. That's a good basis for character. <laughs> I love fighting game characters. I love fighting game character designs. I can't stop looking at the artwork. Actually, today, it's not a fighting game, though it was a Jason. I was looking at some, like, Fatal Fury, but mm. it was only because I was also trying to look at, like, a retrospective on Metal Slug. I just, like, I love that entire era of, like, video game art. It's so sumptuous. Last question from Brent before we wrap up the show here. Why is Rachel Distler so awesome, and what is her secret? So we are going to be doing this question, I see. Um, I'm wondering I mean, how long I can, I, I'm going to let you suffer before I try and jump in and oh save you. Oh my but. God, we're really sticking the needles at me here. I mean, in an ideal world, I would say like, I wake up at the crack of dawn and I, I drink a glass of water within the first 30 minutes of waking and I fling open my windows and I sing with the birds. Um, but more often than not, uh, <laughs> I'm usually waking up like a complete bedheaded mess and I don't know what day it is and I'm not really sure what time it is either. Uh, so if I have to say if there's any secret sauce to the Rachel Disler recipe, it would always go back to those two, maybe even three wolves. Who, who even knows? Uh, just having a continuous dialogue <laughs> of just like when your approach to the creative problem um, I mean, sometimes the wolves are very, very distracting, but sometimes they come up with a very good idea. Uh, sometimes you just have to let, I'm going to say this, and I don't know if my wife is going to watch this interview, but I'm going to say a phrase that um, we use as an, as an in-joke. And uh, you, you just got to trust the process. You just got to trust the process. Uh, that's the secret sauce is just um, <laughs> letting the day take you. I don't know what's the name of that comic i'm just thinking about it right now there's like this one panel comic where it's like the adventures of like lady no kids and she's just like dressed in a top hat and a, and a jacket no pants and looking at like the couple who is pushing a baby carriage and she's just like with her monocle just like standing by a goose and she's just like yeah you know i'm just gonna spend my day just following this goose around that's the secret sauce just follow the goose and trust the process. Well, I can't, I can't ask any more questions after that one. So that works <laughs> <laughs> I'll say from an outside point of view, I think what makes uh, Rachel Disler so amazing is oh that uh, she is uh, always uh, willing to match uh, enthusiasm for, for the project and, and, and meets the assignment head on and uh, goes <laughs> above and beyond what you expect her to do. So every time I get pages back for uh, for the cat skin and the rose, it is it always features something that's like we could have done this normal, but I decided to go total sicko mode and just and just make it as as absolutely cool as it could possibly be. That's following the goose. That's just it's, like exactly you got to follow the goose. Like, yeah, I know you saw like the thumbnails for. I'm the, I think I'm even specifically thinking about page. Oh, what is it? 31? It's one I haven't like put the colors up for yet. Yeah. Um, so yeah, they, they have this like near kiss and uh, it could have just been a, a quiet, tender moment between the two of them. But no, no. Now there are dozens of roses around them. Yeah. It's just, just like to, to frame the, the, the panel in a way that is so over the top, it, it shoots the moon and goes right back to being rad. Like I haven't even put like the sparkles or anything in there yet. Like <laughs> you have to go full shoujo if you're going to do it. Like that's, that's the thing. And so when I follow that goose, it's like, look, it's four in the morning. You could go to bed. It's like, but the goose is still going. You got to figure out where it's going. I'm like, okay. It could that's, be anywhere. That's, it could uh, go. It could, it could, if I stop now, I, it you'll could never be know. Anywhere. I'll never know. <laughs> So yeah, that's that's the that's the secret sauce. Well, I I'm not adding any more to this. I think that's a great <laughs> place to stop. <laughs> 
Well, Wells and Rachel, I do hate to say it, but that ends this particular episode of Two Geeks Talking. I want to thank you both so much for coming on the show. Well, thanks, Kurt. It's been like really nice to come back for like a second time. Yeah, it's nice to come back for only a second time. That's how many times <laughs> I've been here. Let's not, let's not count. <laughs> uh, no, thank you so much for having me. Uh, I appreciate it, and uh, it's always a pleasure, Kurt means you both have to come back on for either another amazing volume of the cat skin and the rose maybe a new animated series possibly something like that i if only <laughs> get the pneumonia treatment where can we find you how can we support you of course where's the kickstarter campaign and anything else you both would like to promote you can find me uh on twitter and i absolutely refuse to uh to call it by its other name, at Wells Thomp, Blue Sky, same thing, W-E-L-L-S-T-H-O-M-P. I have a, a website, wellsthompson.com, that will redirect you to a bunch of other things, one of which being my Substack, which is Comics, Cats, and Cocktails, the newsletter where we talk about all of those things. And I have a Ko-Fi page, or coffee, or however you pronounce it, where you can uh, purchase some of my comics as well as buy me a coffee. Otherwise... The Kickstarter is on Kickstarter, not surprisingly, uh, and will be there for the next week. Uh, it ends uh, Thursday, August 10th at 11 a.m. Central Standard Time. So get your copy before then or uh, live with regret for the rest of your life. There's a good amount of dead air. I really just want people to like sit with that one because I... Uh, <laughs> I think that people will regret if we do not get those mini comics, or at least again, I will, and I will spread that misery, I swear to God. <laughs> For me, um, I'm luckily Red Tie Bear, literally just everywhere. Uh, that's my website, redtiebear.com. I'm Red Tie Bear on Twitter, Blue Sky, Instagram. I might even dust off my Red Tie Bear Tumblr because apparently people are going back to Tumblr. I'm just trying to figure out where everyone's going. But if if uh, you're looking for me and there's a social media, if you type in Red Tie Bear, you will probably find me. Oh, yeah. I just also want to say um, big ups, mad ups to, uh, you know, uh, Angela Wu and Tango, Rio Burton. And actually um, big ups to Fel as well for recommending uh, Rio um, for like one of the mini comments. I'm like, yes, yes, this <laughs> This makes sense. I want well, this. Also, I, I have we haven't taken the time to shout out uh, Fellhound and Skylar Patrick, who did the wonderful covers for uh, for the Catskin and the Rose, as well as uh, Keila Saval, who's doing the letters, and uh, Brenda Snell, who does the design. Uh, all of which are wonderfully talented uh, creators. Oh, and Krista Herratter, who's the uh, uh, editor. So, all wonderful creators. Uh, all uh, bringing their A-game to this project. Yeah, they're just um, totally crushing it. You know, I, sometimes I just go back and I look at uh, Kiela's letters and I'm just like, oh, oh yeah. And then sometimes I, I will admit, I sit there, like there's a, if you go to our Kickstarter and you want to see both of the covers for the Cats and the Rose, there is, of course, that one image that swaps between mm -hmm. um, Skylar's and Fell's covers. And sometimes I just sit there and I'm like, yes, yes, this pleases me. I, I just let it wash over <laughs> me. I also, you know, uh, thinking about it, want to say uh, big ups to uh, Marcus uh, Jimenez for making a uh, fan art for the uh, Kickstarter, it like, I've never gotten fan art before. At first it felt like with the covers, I was like, oh my God, how, look how they like imbutified my children. Uh, <laughs> when I <laughs> uh, made, uh, when I you know, like made the character designs and seeing like somebody else's interpretations and it's like seeing um, unsolicited fan art was just like, oh my God, is this what it feels like? This is what it feels like to be a, a big brain creator. Really love all the talent and all the support that's gone for the Kickstarter. Um, and I hope that, you know, by the week's end, everybody who wants a copy gets their copy. Well, like I said, that ends this particular episode of Two Geeks Talk. You can, of course, find this interview and a thousand plus others on our website, tgtmedia.com or twogeekstalking.com. That's T-W-O. And, of course, the podcast is back on any of your favorite podcast streaming services, just search for Two Geeks Talking or you can find it on twogeekstalking.podbean.com. 
the YouTube channel is definitely a lot more updated than both of those sites because I'm only one person. It is youtube.com forward slash TGT media. Like, subscribe, share this interview. And of course, Rachel's and Wells' other interviews as well. It's too in the past and show some love for those interviews. And as I say every week, everyone has a story to tell. It's up to me to help bring that out. Thanks for listening and watching on to Geeks Talking.